the Father of glory, may he give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the work of his great might. Let us worship.
Second Chronicles, the 24th chapter, kind of the backstory is in uh, chapters uh, 22 and 23, and uh, af- after today you may want to go back and review those and get that context and, uh, and that time. And truly what we see as we're working our way through Chronicles is that there is no new thing under the sun. That's what Ecclesiastes says, and it is, it's true. We read it, and... Um, no one's shocked and falling out of their seats at uh, wickedness uh, because there's no new thing under the sun. And God remains holy and faithful always, and He is our hope. And so the Word continues to direct our attention and our hearts uh, to rest on Him. So we come to the 24th chapter of Second Chronicles This is the word of God. Joash was seven years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zabiah of Beersheba. And Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. Jehoiada got for him two wives, and he had sons and daughters. After this, Joash decided to restore the house of the Lord, and he gathered the priests and the Levites, and he said to them, Go out to the cities of Judah and gather from all Israel money to repair the house of your God from year to year, and see that you act quickly. But the Levites did not act quickly. So the Lord summoned Jehoiada, the chief, and he said to him, Why have you not required the Levites to bring in from Judah and Jerusalem the tax levied by Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the congregation of Israel for the tent of testimony? For the sons of Athaliah, that wicked woman, had broken into the house of God, and had also used all the dedicated things of the house of the Lord for the Baals. So the king commanded, and they made a chest, and set it outside the gate of the house of the Lord, and proclamation was made throughout Judah and Jerusalem to bring in for the Lord the tax that Moses, the servant of God, laid on Israel in the wilderness. And all the princes and all the people rejoiced. And brought their tax and dropped it into the chest until they had finished. And whenever the chest was brought to the king's officers by the Levites, when they saw that there was much money in it, the king's secretary and the officer of the chief priest would come and empty the chest and take it and return it to its place. And thus they did day after day and collected money in abundance. 
And the king and Jehoiada gave it to those who had charge of the work of the house of the Lord. And they hired masons and carpenters to restore the house of the Lord and also workers in iron and bronze to repair the house of the Lord. So those who were engaged in the work labored and the repairing went forward in their hands and they restored the house of God to its proper condition and strengthened it. And when they had finished, they brought the rest of the money before the king and Jehoiada and with it were made utensils for the house of the Lord, both for the service and for the burnt offerings and dishes for incense and vessels of gold and silver. And they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord regularly all the days of Jehoiada. But Jehoiada grew old and full of days and died. He was 130 years old at his death. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel and toward God and his house. Now after the death of Jehoiada, the princes of Judah came and paid homage to the king. And then the king listened to them. And they abandoned the house of the Lord, the God of their fathers, and served the Asherim and the idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this guilt of theirs. Yet he sent prophets among them to bring them back to the Lord. These testified against them, but they would not pay attention. And then the Spirit of of God clothed Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada the priest, And he stood above the people and he said to them, Thus says God, why do you break the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has forsaken you. But they conspired against him and by command of the king they stoned him with stones in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus Joash the king did not remember the kindness that Jehoiada, Zechariah's father, had shown him, but killed his son. And he, when he was dying, he said, May the Lord see and avenge. When I was uh, <clears throat> on sabbatical about 16 years ago and uh, went to, uh, uh, each Sunday I'd go worship at a different place and and so the last Sunday I was going to be on sabbatical, I checked with Clonell and said, would you find if this particular evangelist is going to be preaching anywhere in, in Atlanta, I'd like to go hear him. And she checked online and said, no, he's not going to be anywhere. So I decided I would go to my friend's church, uh, Peachtree Corners, and worship there. And I did, and I look across the aisle, and this particular evangelist that I was asking about is sitting across the aisle from me, worshiping at the same church. Well, later I checked with uh, my friend, I was like, I, I can't believe this. I, honestly, I wasn't going to come to hear you today. I was going to go hear him. And uh, he said, so you like to listen to this guy? I said, yeah, I do. And he goes, and who do you think he listens to? <laughs> so, and he was this kind of, John was a very humble guy. He was, he was kidding. He was not full of himself. But who do you listen to? Who has your ear? That's what we're thinking about today. Joash was only a year old when he had been hidden in the temple. And now six years later, he becomes king at the age of seven. And he reigns for 40 years. And Jehoiada, the priest, who was his uncle and his guardian, guided him in these early years. And obviously was greatly influential in in the remaining years in the course of his reign. Uh, Jehoiada had King Joash's ear. The backstory to the coronation of this young king is that his grandmother, Athaliah, was the daughter of Ahab of Israel and possibly Jezebel, the mother's not mentioned, and she had married, hang with me here, this is a little bit of a drama, she had married Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, whom we looked at last week, and and actually she factored into his drift from the Lord. After the death of her husband and other key family members, Athaliah did what many grandmothers do. She set about killing them all. She wanted to become queen. And so she began to eliminate anyone who was in the Davidic line within the family. And so this is an exciting and and thrilling coup. And and little uh, 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 Joash who is in the line of David, is now on the throne uh, there in Judah. Athaliah thought she had killed them all off. She was beautiful. This was a thirst 
for power, a craving for power. And there are certain men and women in the world who will do anything, and I mean anything, for power. Every group has a class of them. There are preachers like that. There are deacons like that. There are politicians of every party and no party like that. Dictators will do it. There are many members of the human family who will stoop to almost anything in order to have power. Like Athaliah, the craving, a craving for power. So her plot was uh, undermined by Jehoshabeth, the daughter of King Joram, uh, who was the aunt of Joash. Follow me? Okay. And she hid him from his murderous grandmother. I'm thinking the next time our grandkids spend the night, that's the bedtime story. (laughs) I'm going to tell them all about murderous grandmother Athaliah. And then say, Mimi will be in in a little while to kiss you good (laughs) night. Sleep tight. (laughs) All this could happen because Jehoshabeth is uh, the sister of Ahaziah. And so she's the aunt and she's the wife of Jehoiada, the priest. And they provide sanctuary. They hide him. I'm like, where would she not look? Well, she never goes to the temple. We'll hide him there. Isn't that something? If you can hide someone at church because you're sure they won't be looking for him there and they won't stumble across him there, that says more about them. And so that's where they hide him. And in the seventh year of her reign, Jehoiada is part of this conspiracy against Athaliah in order to restore the proper line of King David to the throne. And along with that, to restore the worship of God, because that's been completely undermined by Athaliah. Her sons go and raid the temple to dedicate the things dedicated to God. Now they're going to be dedicated to the Baals. She doesn't have a long reign, but in short order, she's created havoc in the land. Nothing new under the sun. There's, there's repetition over and over and over of the same thing. Sin always brings complications. It brings trouble. It brings heartbreak, duplicity, brokenness, and ultimately sin brings the judgment of God. Revival restores. Revival restores peace. It restores unity. It restores quiet to the land, uh, to a community, to the church. So Jehoiada's influence with Johash is clear. He mentored him. He guided him during the early parts uh, of, his, <coughs> of his reign. Joash did what was right as long as Joash had his ear. We have a strange statement I'm just going to touch on here because in verse 3 it does note that um, It says that uh, Jehoiada got for him two wives, and he had sons and daughters. Now, first of all, understand it wasn't when he was seven, okay? But the other thing here, it's not saying that this was the right thing to do. It's reported here not as an example to follow. It's reported here for one reason, because this is what happened. You see, sometimes... God's people, sometimes leaders don't do the right thing. Every leader. That's part of the problem of of canceling people because at some point, somewhere, somewhere along the line, they messed up. And maybe they messed up big time. But it doesn't define who they are now. And yet, if you hold that, nobody, literally nobody can stand. He was a godly king in those years. But this part wasn't right. It's not what God had ordained. And, and usually, with, in, particularly in royalty, these marriages would be arranged and there were treaties involved. But it's still, whatever the reasons, basically when we move away from what God's Word says and say, but, but we're going to do it this way, we're already off course in our own lives as well. So there is uh, all of this. Now, Chronicles, remember, is written to people returning from exile. It's to help and encourage them. And this temple is in disarray. 
And so this is that they would be concerned and they would be encouraged about bringing about the full restoration and the operation of the temple once again. And so Jehoiada encouraged Joash in all of this. And yet it's still in disreputable uh, condition. Um, there wasn't a big revival under Joash, but there was some revival. At least it was moving in the right direction. Um, and so he, he's encouraging them. It's not going to be easy, but it is a matter of priorities. Life is always about priorities. Right? Our first priority, Jesus, when asked, well, what is the great commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. I think it's over here. And love your neighbor as yourself is over on this side. Sums up the law and the prophets. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's about priorities. Putting the first things first. So Joash and they have a chest made. It's put outside the door and people... I love this portion. You don't read this much. They rejoice as they bring their taxes. Just like you guys, right? They rejoice as they bring their taxes. And they keep filling up the box. And so then they put the workers to work. And this government project finishes under budget. This is real. This, this part's real. They're reporting it because we would never believe it otherwise. And with the money that was left, they began to utilize it to put together the, the necessary, um, it calls them utensils here, the service instruments for the worship that would take place in the temple. It's just fascinating to me. And then the other part, and they gave until it was finished. How often do you get a sense that people implementing a tax have a sense of, and when it's finished? Like when you die. And we're working on that. No, it was finished. They, they had this and it was put together. The application for those returning is that they would evaluate their own commitment and work and support of the temple of God and for followers of the Lord Jesus since the coming of Jesus there's this question that are we satisfied with much lesser effort much lesser commitment to the holy things of God because Jesus died and paid it all for us God forbid that we would say well because Jesus did all that I I should be less committed less thankful less engaged no, it should be quite the other way around in this growing momentum. So as long as the high priest Jehoiada lived, he had Joash's ear, and the spirit of revival continued on, and the people gathered to worship God in the house of the Lord. But verse 15 says, And then Jehoiada died at the age of 130. And because of his piety, because of his reformations, because of his uh, tutorage of uh, King Joash, he is actually buried among the kings of the city. He's given a royal, uh, a royal uh, funeral, royal honors at his death. And after the death of Jehoiada, a new era begins. New leaders had the king's ear. And it wasn't long before Joash turned from his early faithfulness and fidelity to the Lord to disobedience. The leaders of Judah influenced the king to abandon, verse 18, to abandon the worship of the Lord and to return to the heathenism of their fathers. The new advisors had the king's ear, and Joash turned away from God. And, and like other kings before him, Joash had gotten to this place that uh, he, he proved to be unfaithful to God once things were pretty secure in the kingdom. It's going along fine. God, we don't need you anymore. We've got this from here on out. That's always the beginning of the end, of the demise. For the returning exiles, there's this warning that applies even to now against permitting the blessings that God brings into our life to lead to infidelity. 
to lead to unfaithfulness to the Lord. So as long as Jehoiada lived, the princes, they didn't dare go in the way of idolatry. Jehoiada was a strong leader, and he had the king's ear. But when these princes take over, first they affirm their allegiance to Joash. We're for you. You're the greatest thing ever. Oh, you are amazing. We hang on every word. It says they paid homage to the king, verse 17. And then they go out in clear rebellion against God. Verse 18, they abandon the house of the Lord. And you know, soon Joash will die at the hands of these leaders, verses 25 and 26. We didn't read that, but that's where it ends up. The infidelity is important as a theological term. He abandoned. It's the same word used in verses 20 and 24 and translated in English as forsaken. It means that they had flagrantly violated their covenant loyalty against God. Joash did just the opposite of what he had done earlier in life. Remember earlier in life? Under Jehoiada, he had restored the temple. Now, he abandons the temple because someone else has his ear. True to his covenant love, true to his steadfast love, which endures forever. The Lord sent prophets to warn people and to encourage them um, but, but to no avail. Verse 19, they, they would not pay attention to them. They wouldn't give them their ear. But the good news is that God has provided a way for rebellious, sinful people to be restored in relationship to God. It was then and it is still. It's called repentance. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we turn from not following to following. That's always the call whenever it happens. So the Lord raised up Zechariah, who is the son of Jehoiada the priest. He fills him with his spirit. He gives him a message of God's judgment. And as in many cases, the purpose of the prophetic ministry was not to condemn because the people were already condemned. They were in rebellion against God. The purpose wasn't to condemn them. The purpose was to call them to repentance leading to renewal of the covenant with God and restoration. But the people would not listen. The question he poses is this, why do you break the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? Obedience leads to a growing prosperity and blessing of God. Disobedience does not lead to God's favor. They had abandoned the Lord. And now they're about to be abandoned. And everything will change. Because Joash has given his ear to someone else. Zechariah's message was not well received. It should have been received with humility and repentance. That would have been the appropriate response. But disregarding the fact that they're standing just outside the temple grounds, they're on holy ground. And thugs pick up stones and they stone Zechariah to death. And why did they do it? Because the king tells them to. He orders his execution. This is the turning point in the narrative. And we see how far Joash has fallen. Zechariah was not only the son of Joash's mentor, Jehoiada. He was also his cousin. But think about it, Jehoiada. I mean, Joash owes him his life. Grandma would have killed him. He owes him all the success of his reign. So we read in verse 22, the king did not remember the kindness Jehoiada, Zechariah's father, has shown him. And why would he do this? It certainly wasn't part of his character as we've seen it throughout his reign. Had he been given wrong information about Zechariah? Maybe. Maybe they had told him things that Zechariah was doing that wasn't true. We, we don't know. All we know is he ordered his death. 
The New Testament says, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, beware bad company corrupts good character. It looks like the evil influences of the princes and their despicable deeds have taken root and they now have the ear of the king and they led him in a bad direction. And yet King Joash is 100% responsible for this. Who is he going to listen to? Will he listen to the Lord or will he listen to others? He's responsible for who he listens to who he would give his ear to. Who has your ear? Who has your ear? Who do you listen to? I'm talking about primarily. Who is your primary influence? Is it the Word of God? Is this your primary influence? Is it CNN? MSNBC? Fox News? NPR? Blogs? Tweets? Facebook? Internet feeds, political party propaganda, primary. What is your primary place of listening? What fills your thoughts? Guide your thoughts. Is the filter for everything else that we hear and we take in, we think about. Last week we heard the fellow that said, We are not the church of Chicken Little. The church of Jesus Christ doesn't run around saying the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Because the church of Jesus Christ knows that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and He reigns and He rules. That's what empowers us. That's what gives us hope and and conviction. If he has our ear, who has your ear? Who has your ear? Zechariah's final word. As he was dying, he said, May the Lord see and avenge. Jehoiada, Zechariah's father, had shown Joash kindness. And Joash killed his son. And when he was dying, he said, may the Lord see and avenge. We're about to come to a table. Uh, The people did not show kindness to God, but killed his son. Jesus' final words were not, may the Lord see and avenge. It was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Who has your ear? It's a story that uh, you, you may know. It's, uh, some think it's true. I, I believe it's urban legend. And, and it's about many years ago, a captain of a ship looked into the dark night, and he, and he saw faint lights in the distance, and And he realized they were on a collision course, and so he has a signalman send a note out uh, to signal that uh, uh, alter your course 10 degrees to the south. And he immediately gets back a response, alter your course 10 degrees north. The captain's a little miffed about this, and so he says, well, send out another signal, say alter your course 10 degrees to south, I'm the captain. And he gets a response, alter your Of course, 10 degrees north. I am third-class seaman Jones. Now the captain's really ticked off. And so he says, send this signal. And this this is going to put fear in his heart. Alter your course 10 degrees south. I'm a battleship. Get the signal back. Alter your course 10 degrees north. I'm a lighthouse. And in the midst of our dark and foggy times, all sorts of voices are shouting orders into the night. They're telling us what to do and how to adjust our lives. And out of the darkness, there is one voice that signals something quite opposite of the rest, something that it seems absurd to some. But the voice happens to be the light of the world. We ignore it at our peril. 
church, Christian, who has your ear? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. The stories of Chronicles give us flawed kings and their consequences. The story of the gospel gives us the perfect king and the consequences of his life and death and resurrection. As we come to the table, does he have your ear? If so, believe the gospel and never stop believing the gospel. Hold fast to the good news of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the free offer of the forgiveness of sins and a righteousness applied and credited to you that doesn't belong to you and that you don't earn it or merit it, but he gives it to you and credits it to you through what he's accomplished. That's the good news. And if he has your ear, then everything else that we have to hear and think about and engage in is put in its proper perspective. But if we silence his voice, we're on the road to ruin. The table sets before us in word and then in tangible expression through the bread and the cup, the reality and the promise of the gospel. And so we read that Apostle Paul says that for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that in the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body. It's given for you. Do this whenever you eat it and remember me. And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it and remember me. For when you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And it's a remembrance and it's a reminder of whose voice we must listen to. Father, we thank you for this bread and cup. And as we commune together by faith, believing the gospel, we pray that you would strengthen and nourish our faith and our hearts and that you would tune our ears all the more to hear and to listen to your word that the work of your Holy Spirit may bring it to fruition each day in our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll begin with the bread as it's distributed. would uh, encourage you to hold it that we might commune together uh, as the body of Christ when the cup is passed uh, a little bit later. Uh, receive the cup because again as we come uh, we each come to the Lord repenting of our sin uh, in that personal relationship to which he's called us. Both are important. We're not just a bunch of individuals. We're the body of Christ. But there is the work of the Holy Spirit in each heart that draws us to the body of Christ. And we acknowledge both. The bread, the body of Christ, Hebrews, third chapter, a couple times it says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. We have double way of hearing his voice at this point. One is through the word, and the other, the other is through the, the sacrament itself. Both testifying to who Jesus is, and what he did, and why it matters forever. This is God's blessing. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen.